It was with sadness, like the rest of the known universe, that I heard just less than two weeks ago of the passing of the modest moonwalker, Neil Armstrong. Making that giant leap onto the great white orb above us will forever be one of humanity's great achievements and adventures. Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins made the impossible feel possible. Well, I know that I will never don a NASA spacesuit, get the countdown and fire off into the blazing sky. I am an astronaut of sorts, a very earthly one. I've flown over the vast white crusty sheet of Antarctica, tried not to disturb its curious and delightful alien-like inhabitants, and stood alone over a frozen turquoise lake and felt light years from home. Antarctica is another world. It's precious, mind-blowingly beautiful. But unfortunately, we have collectively touched it. It is no longer pristine. I was not an Antarctic tourist. I went there twice for work. I'm not a scientist, Antarctic tradie, stranded illegal fisherman, or any of the other usual suspects of the small pool of people that are lucky enough to crunch the ice down there. I'm a 21st century journalist, and I just wanted to share my very short time on the icy continent. My first Antarctic trip was as, the, as a recipient of the Australian Antarctic Division's inaugural media fellowship. For 33 days and many bright sunlit nights and quite a few fogged over ones, and that was with cameraman Michael Chook Brooks, I covered incredible marine and climate science taking place on the Antarctic icebreaker Aurora Australis. The second trip, a year later, again in the heart of the Antarctic summer, I boarded the now very familiar red-orange icebreaker, again in Hobart, with cameraman Pete Curtis and producer Ben Hawke, and headed due south for ice isolation, and most importantly, for Douglas Mawson. The South Australian geologist had done his own extraordinary piece of adventuring 100 years earlier. Mawson and his landing party had gone ashore at Antarctica's Commonwealth Bay in the name of Australia, science, and not finding a better place to pitch tents and build huts after weeks of looking. This inhospitable, icy and wind-blasted penguin rookery turned out to be one of the worst possible places to hang out for a few years on Antarctica. And then 100 years later, it's still a bugger to get to. And that's probably for the best. Nothing about going to Antarctica is easy. There's red tape, a cost you've got to justify to the ABC and therefore taxpayers. Personal risk and the extreme likelihood of vomiting in the first few excited days on the ship. The latter delightfully happened to me about two minutes before a live phone interview with Radio National's weekend breakfast program. <laughs> but I pride myself on being a trooper and I soldiered on. It may have taken the two trips on the Aurora Australis for the crew to really trust me. I was there to report on science and Antarctic history, but I was butting into their world, an incredible workplace that takes us to the end of our world. There I was, though, on the ship's bridge, sizing up enormous icebergs with an old-school sextant, touring the deafening engine room to see what was running the ship, and in one bizarre moment, waltzing with the ship's communications officer, him in a kilt, me in pants, on the bow for a fun freeze frame for the Aurora's webcam. As I said, though, I was there to report on science. Every three hours or so, the ship stopped and held position as scientists, led by the CSIRO's Steve Rintou, oh, ordered expensive and precise testing equipment thousands of metres down to the ocean floor. This professional round-the-clock effort that I witness is the base data on temperature, salinity, carbon and nutrients that humanity will be using for decades to come as we come to grips with man-made climate change. We all marvelled at the tiny sea snails scooped from the swirling waters of the ship's stern. These winged and dart-shaped creatures aren't as iconic as the whales and penguins down south, but they are an important part of the aquatic food web. The scientists say they won't be able to form their shells in a few decades due to that often underreported side of climate change, ocean acidification. 
The Southern Ocean stores vast quantities of the world's carbon emissions. Steve Rintoul would say, if it wasn't for the ocean acting as a sponge, climate would be changing more rapidly than it is today. These Australian scientists are working hard in a very isolated part of the world to understand how the entire ocean system works, how it's changing, and what's likely to happen if it changes further. The big Antarctic if is the weather. It's the difference between getting the job done or not. It's the difference between life and death. Almost 100 years ago, Douglas Mawson lost two of his people, Xavier Mertz and Belgrave Ninnis, on his expedition. And the continent has claimed many more lives since. Me, I jammed a finger in a swinging door. <coughs> Slipped on falling ice on sea deck as the icebreaker was being parked on a giant field of fast ice and curse the beautiful grey skies for poor filming and helicopter flying weather. When finally I could fly onto Antarctica, it was for as long as Armstrong and Aldrin were on the moon, just two hours or so. I made it count. I sweated in my Antarctic extreme weather gear as I bounded around Mawson's huts. I made sure I didn't get snow blind, and I restrained myself from urges to run off and explore. As the simple ceremony was set up to commemorate the Mawson landing, a big flagpole that the catabatic winds would not push over, I recorded camera pieces for TV News and the 7.30 report, hurried off an interview with Antarctic historian Tom Griffiths, filed two radio news stories and started snapping wildly with my trusty camera. I could see, hear and, oh dear me, smell the nesting penguins nearby. There were thousands, many thousands of Adelis in the rookery with their grey fuzzy chicks. Virtually all of these Antarctic aliens were nonplussed by the history we were there to mark. One or two of the black and white little fellas came by to bolster our numbers under a disappearing blue sky as Antarctic Division Chief Tony Fleming gave a fine speech for Mawson's efforts and raised the Australian flag in his honour. I kept wanting to stop for a bit and just soak it all in, or maybe just run over to the nearest snowy ridge and see what was there. It really does get to the point where you don't want to close your eyes. Every time I'd check off my to-do list in my mind, I'd magically see a penguin waddling or stomach surfing by. They had the right idea, but we visitors were running out of time. Of course, there are the huts themselves, and what a privilege it was to step inside. You can still smell the dirty seal blubber fuel that the Mawson men used to heat the place, and I love the hall crystals that clung to the old, cold Baltic pine. The space is so small. I can't imagine living there during the worst of the worst. We looked at the sad bunks where Mertz and Ninnis used to sleep. After Mawson returned alone from the disastrous Southeast Survey mission, no one slept inside the dead men's bunks again. It's recounted that their surviving friends sobbed in the night at the news of their passing. The huts have survived thanks to the work of the volunteers at the Mawson's Huts Foundation, and they can only do so much. When we had arrived there, one of the roof hatches had been blown off and far away by the area's fierce winds. Damage could really have been done to the insides of the huts if our exhibition had not arrived. I did two things for myself when finally standing on Antarctica. One, I ambled over large rocks and melting ice creeks to join other expeditioners near, but not too near, the nesting Adelis. There's little comical about the penguins covered in their own excrement but it was incredible to experience these creatures holding on to life in this usually lonely part of the world. The second thing I did was wander solo to that frozen lake I mentioned earlier, while waiting for a return flight to the mothership. I could do nothing more for my Mawson stories for the ABC until I was sitting in front of a computer. So there I was, stomping through snow in my big boots, walking over a little rise and feeling very much alone. Cut off from people for a brief moment, the only sounds I could hear were of delirious, sleep-deprived penguin parents cutting through the building whoosh of the local breeze. I edged as close as I could to the lake without falling through. It was beautiful. Low cloud was again rolling in, flattening out the light. Chopper flights out of there had to happen soon or not at all. 
I've been encouraged not to take photos. I couldn't help myself. Just have a moment there, they said, without technology. One thing I didn't get a shot of was a clumsy petrol that flew in, hit the ice, shattered it and took off again. You'll have to take my word for it. Right at the end of the frozen over was a glimpse of the fast ice the ship had spent the last few days on. And there she was, I saw her as a red speck in the distance, the Aurora Australis. The takeoff from Antarctica was hard. Not technically, it's just that the place always leaves you wanting more. I had news pressures, deadlines, phone crosses and triumphant tweets to send out to the world. And there is the remarkable element about reporting from the end of the Earth in 2012. It can be done. With more than a little help from my colleagues in the mainland, the Antarctic experience can be shared. The ABC team used the ship's communications where possible to send back stories, blog updates, photos and tweets under my name. We had some of the finest minds in Antarctic science and history on the ship, the best scenery the world can offer, and only three working journalists. That was myself, Lloyd Jones from AAP, and the ABC veteran producer, Ben Hawke. Not to forget, of course, the most excellent camera work of the ABC's Pete Curtis, Chuck Brooks, and AAP's photographer, Dean Lewins. Back at the ABC, I had the invaluable and tireless support of online producer, Matthew Liddy. There was one time during the Brisbane floods, he was updating the Antarctic blog on his iPhone while bucketing out his own home. The days below the Antarctic Circle are long, drawn out and intense. You don't want to miss a thing. Some of the writing and work demands kept me indoors while Antarctica was pumping outside. This self-imposed situation still sounds like a grand injustice many months later. I'd know that other people and penguins were outside frolicking on the ice without me. However, one of the best moments of the whole Antarctic experience came from one of those sad days of sitting behind a computer while tapping away, while we were stuck tight on the fast ice at Commonwealth Bay. The white world looked glorious outside, but the clouds were saying no flying that day to Mawson's huts. Just to get outside as much as anything, I hastily arranged a lightning-quick post-dinner photograph of Steve Rintoul's marine science team on the ice in front of the ship. The big, bright, red-orange bow looked stunning against all that white. As I crouched down, snapping away with my favourite wide-angle lens, I was set upon by an angry, fast-moving, squawking pack of Adelie penguins. I was laughing, simpering at and photographing the usually cute attackers all at the same time. The somewhat violent experience led to the best photographs of the entire trip. <laughs> Virtually everything I experienced during those precious weeks was for the audience. No one should overshare and I really only banged on about vomiting once, but I am very aware that I was asked to go as a reporter, not as a tourist on a deck chair. I wanted people to know what it was like not just to go to Antarctica, but travel on a working scientific ship and go along with me to Mawson's huts and beyond. I took that same principle recently to the London Olympics, which I reported on for ABC News Online. In amongst the sporting results, news flashing stories, photos and live tweeting events, I offered ABC audiences a taste of what it's like to cover the biggest event in the world. I talked about the interactions with athletes and security, I spied empty seats at supposedly sold out events and shared the ride to far flung Olympic venues. I'm toying with naming the London Olympics the hardest job I have ever done, but Antarctica would be a close second. Both involve hardly any sleep, the carrying of a lot of gear, not eating enough, and the usual navigation of some very interesting personalities. You do it because you love the job, with all its faults, because it takes you to the end of the earth and back. Pete Curtis, that amazing ABC cameraman, has written about our trip to Mawson's hut. He says his most privileged and almost spiritual moment was finding himself alone in the main hut, peering into Frank Hurley's old, tiny dark room. The photographer has written in chalk on the wall, near enough is not good enough. 
Pete says it gave him goosebumps to read the words under torchlight. For me, even now, after all these months, recounting the inspirational words of a long dead man makes me pause. My fondest memories are the ones that made me feel like I was roaming the universe. The cold sun lighting up thousands of penguin tracks across a vast, flat expanse of ice. The ship charging through a field of ice flows and taming waves under brilliant, shimmering auroras. And hearing tales of the wild southern seas from the bridge crew as they let me play my music at 2am. I know that going to Antarctica once was a privilege, and twice was really pushing it. But I also felt that near enough was not good enough. And after not setting foot on the continent the first time, despite it being one nautical mile away in the mist, I had to finish my Antarctic adventure.